Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? Yay. I'm Dave Ferguson, Dean of the College. Glad to welcome you here. Um, so the end of the year is coming quickly. Uh, we have two more lectures counting today. Uh, I want to just give you a heads up on the final lecture of the year. It is uh, the Ethan Whitehead Memorial Lecture in Sustainability. We, we launched that last year, had a, had a great event. And this year we have uh, ZDF principal Nat Slayton and uh, he'll be talking about the, mostly the Portland Airport project, which is really interesting. It's one of the best examples of sustainability and, and resilient design in the country right now. Um, one of their goals, for example, is that they expect to achieve a 50% carbon reduction over the existing airport structure. And there's a lot of innovation, mass timber, et cetera, that's, that's really great. You can find them online. Uh, find the project online and, and their explanation of the project. But I encourage you to come. Uh, it's in two weeks. Uh, I hope you'll spread the word. Uh, and it's also during Ball State's inaugural Chirps Week. How many people have heard of Chirps Week? I would not be one to raise my hand either because I've not been paying attention to it. But apparently it's a new thing and there are prizes involved and this counts towards something. So uh, you might keep your eyes open for that. But nonetheless, today's lecture is a particularly special one. We have one of our own here, Neil Beckstead, and we love to welcome our own grads back to CAP whenever possible. So uh, Neil is a graduate of our architecture program. He works as an interior designer in New York City, has a range of successes in design that you'll hear about that have been nationally recognized. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Dr. Sarah Alfaro, Associate Professor of Interior Design, and she will introduce you to our guest. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to introduce Neil Beckstead, who graduated from Ball State with his bachelor's in architecture in 2000. He soon left the Hoosier State for New York City, where he worked for Keenan Riley Architects. He spent eight years as a studio and design director with S. Russell Groves before opening his studio, Neil Beckstead Studio, in 2010. Neil's work has been recognized by Architectural Digest, El Decor, House Beautiful, The New York Times, Lux, New York Magazine, among many others. He is frequently listed on El Decor's A-list and listed in Architectural Digest AD100 list. This spring, he's launching his furniture gallery in Brooklyn's Navy Yard, where he will debut his own line of furniture alongside a collection of vintage and antique pieces. Please help me welcome back Neil Beckstead to CAP. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you all for having me. It's um, a great opportunity to be here. Uh, it's quite humbling, to be honest, and qu quite surreal. I haven't been back uh, since I graduated. Uh, a lot of things have changed, but surprisingly, a lot has not. Uh, things kind of are consistent, and that's a good thing as well. Uh, a little bit about me uh, to expand. Uh, I did study architecture and I moved to New York. Um, I think we all have experiences where you kind of just feel you have a desire to do something and moving to New York for me was just something I had to do. I just wanted to be in the city. Um, I, and, and I think architecture played a huge role in that and architecture was, is so inspiring for me as a young kid. As I, I was a very young child, I always knew I wanted to become an architect I hear this from every architect I meet. I don't know why that is. I think it's such a transformative thing as kids. When something happens for me, my parents renovated the farmhouse. They also were so supportive of giving me tools and things to play with as a young kid that I became very creative at a very young age. And I think obviously that was a game changer for me and that set the stage for me coming here. And when I came here, CAP was in the middle of America and it was kind of the opposite of New York City, but it was incredible opportunity of travel. Uh, we ha I traveled all around there every year. We went somewhere and I took full advantage of it. Um, and that changed my life profoundly. And due to obviously my parents, the, this college, I am where I am today. Um, travel is so important. It, it still inspires me. It's one of the 
things I want to talk about most today is to always be inspired and travel is a huge part of that. It gets you out of your comfort zone. You see new things, you see new people, you see new cultures. You can be inspired from every aspect, from their cuisine to their outfits to their own architecture to their own spaces to their own interactions. All of that is new, it's different, it makes you think differently. And as a designer, whether you're an architect, interior designer, landscape designer, getting in front of new experiences is, I think, the most important thing we need to do to really think creatively. Um, and so here today, I really want to talk about interiors because as an architect, uh, I found myself moving to New York, and of course, a lot of New York City architects do interior spaces. So my first job was with John Keenan, and we built houses around the tri-state area. And he also put me on his own apartment, which was nerve-wracking as hell. I remember getting out of school and not sure what to do, and he put me in his own apartment. And you kind of just have to step up and ask questions, to be honest, and really asking questions is still what I do today to make understand what should we do and how would, what's the next step. But that became very informative because John turned to me and said, Neil, what do you want to do for the carpet? And at that point, I had no idea what to do with a carpet. I, I never taught carpet. I, uh, was barely taught about interior space, to be honest. Uh, and uh, there's no fault in that. It's just the nature of architecture. There's a lot to cover. And we think of architecture, and the first thing we think of is a building and from afar. And so we think of a building as an object, as a mass. And never do we really think of architecture as an interior space. So today I'm going kind to of talk about how to really flip that script and think and think and to push your minds to really think about architecture in other ways. And whether it's architecture, interior design, interior decorating, design, there's so many titles, so many labels, and there's no right or wrong. We all have specialty, we all are specialists, and I think that's the biggest thing that's changed in this world. So we'll get to all of that. Um, so it's jumping in. Uh, So, it's not here. Uh, so with architecture, um, architecture is more than facade. But a building is not built for solely viewing it from the outside. A building is meant to be used. It is meant to be lived in. It is meant to be worked in, to rest in, to socialize in, to celebrate in, and to worship in, to govern in, to cry in, to laugh in, to do something in. This is architecture. But notice what I said. I said in. It's about being in a building. So behind every building, there should be an interior. And there is. And every interior has to be treated as much as what you think of the outside. Um, so I urge you all, when you think today in studio, but also more importantly, when you leave here, think about interiors. Think about the inside out. Think about how the interiors relates to the shell. Think about how the furniture positions in the space to really, really echo the structure, the columns, the windows. This, for instance, is an office we did. It's a 40,000 square foot office. And uh, it's right in Chelsea. It's right down the street from our office. And it was for an ongoing client. And it was a really pragmatic. Uh, design challenge is about using very mundane and simple materials, plywood that we stain uh, ebony. And, and obviously with an office, you are trying to keep costs low. As a business owner, and uh, you obviously want to keep overhead low. Obviously when you have a 40,000 40, square foot space, things add up quickly. So you have to make really smart moves with very little. You can't rely on Extra. So you have to use the most simple element and think about those details and drill that down to floor finishes from the change in the floor finish from the lobby to start demarking space to thinking about how the plywood can be used to stack up to, stack up to make actual furniture uh, and also using furniture in itself as spatial dividers. These 
polycarbonate uh, volumes that you see in the background are plastic. They're four by eight sheets. They're about $100 each. And we screwed them to uh, wood two by fours, which creates room dividers, but also they were private uh, booths for employees to, to work in. So really thinking creat creatively and thinking about interiors as an architectural element. I mean, I use the word architectural meaning. We always, we all know when you're looking at massing or a building or structure about architecturally pushing forms and, and, and such. And interiors, somehow we've kind of forgotten that and we kind of just apply. The same strategy should be talked about with interiors, about how we can carve space and we can carve space and articulate forms through color and materiality. And behind every facade is an interior, and behind every interior there is a building shell. So I want to re really reiterate that these two are very married, and I think in architecture we always think about the exterior. And so I came, come here today to really talk about how all great buildings have great interiors. A great exterior with no great interior is not great architecture. So I want to move to some of my travels, which I mentioned, which have been so informative. Uh, and this is one of them during my school, schooling here. I had the great opportunity to go to Italy. Um, and after Italy, I backpacked solely around Europe. And through that, those trips, looking back at it, has informed my career. I, I didn't really realize this until a few weeks ago and getting ready for this presentation, I started pulling out photographs, photographs of my time here. And photographs were all of buildings, of course, except this one. This one, when I arrived in Paris, I took a bus, which was kind of shocking at the time, back in 20, or 1998, in trying to find this house. It was a journey, getting there pre-iPhone, not speaking French, but I managed to get here and it changed my life. This is Villa Sawa. It was designed by Le Corbusier and his cousin, uh, Pierre Jean Array, if you're not familiar, but I'm sure you are. It's so iconic. It's iconic from the outside. It's, it was revolutionary um, at the time. It still kind of is, 100 years later. But what struck me was not only this amazing exterior and all the forms that you see here, and how you lived and how living was on the second floor. But was most revolutionary to me was how interior space was starting to be carved out. Here you can kind of see that, how the volume is pushed in for an exterior terrace. But more importantly, this was my first experience really seeing a building other than from a textbook or a slide, an actual space I walked through and it was a really good building to do that, as your first, to be honest. And it struck me, and how he designed everything. The flooring, and you can see here, the subtle details I want to point out here, how that made this great building great architecture because of the interior, not just because of the exterior. The hallway, the material change. The material also is then on the 45. The plain of blue color, the simple, light fixture, all very straightforward, all very tectonic, all very on his design thesis of a house as a machine. The doors are painted or stained a dark, dark black for emphasis and also for hierarchy. It gives you purpose, it gives you where to go. And then that black repeats in the stair, which this curving stair, it's been repeated a zillion times since this was built but it's still one of the better stairs because he put this in the middle of a room. And so as you go up the stair, you see the living room, you see the spaces, and you can orient yourself. It's not tucked in a corner with walls around it. It's pretty incredible. Oops. Moving to the living room, which was shocking to me, he painted a wall pink. No, no one talked about color and interior space before this. It was incredible to me. And then on top of it, the little shears on either side of the window. 
he designed the window perfectly and then left a, a gap for the perfect amount of curtains to sit on, to filter the light. And then all trimmed perfectly on a ledge. The ledge also acting as a barrier to, from the radiator to prevent burning and, and a ledge for serving. So all of this very thought through. And of course, he designed every single piece of furniture in here. So not only did he do the site plan, not only did he do the massing, but he thought of every single detail. Even the light fixture, notice the light fixture. Pardon the poor photography. I've gotten to be a better photographer as the years gone by. This one's a little cropped, but he designed this light, which is a beautiful, fix, uh, beautiful object in itself. It's uh, polished steel, and then it shines light onto the matte white ceiling. So lighting, filtering lighting, artificial lighting, materiality, all works perfectly with his design thesis. And even notice the furniture layout. It's all random, but yet it's all cohesive because he designed it and it's all working very well and it provides that flexibility. Moving to the bathroom, which also like took my breath away and really made me realize the power, and more importantly, made me realize the power of what we can do on interior spaces. A bathroom could be, ah, it's a bathroom, let someone else figure it out. No, F take it to the nth degree. Look what Le Corbusier did. He revolutionized the bathroom. This bathroom is still referenced by every architect on the planet. It still has been revolutionary. It still looks modern. It still looks like a bathroom from 2024. He in its simple, simple moves, he put, positioned everything in this bathroom like he treated the exterior. He played with form and objects, a negative space. He created the skylight right over the area where you need the light, the sink. He created the light right next to the column, which actually, is obviously, which is a structure as well. The subtle positioning of the, the water closet and the vanity and the radiator even then from this amateur photograph I took, has a beautiful composition. Everything is considered. His plumbing, which you'll see in another photo, is beautifully done. That was not by accident. Trust me, if this was done by accident, it would be a lot different than this. Uh, you, uh, one thing I've learned, you, you are given free reign to really build something, but to build something to this degree, you have to really specify, outline, and work with your contractors and tradespeople to really achieve this. And this was an in incredible revolutionary house because of this. Notice the, the plain of red, the blue tile, the infamous day bed. These are all things he considered. He considered the shower curtain, how it perfectly meets at the knee wall. The bathroom also, the layout is revolutionary in that it doesn't have just four solid walls. It opens up to the bedroom. So he you know, not only thought creatively about finishes and how to use them, but also how the space can be opened up. So in terms of function, The kitchen, another example where he really revolutionized the kitchen. I mean, you can see here a, the perfect example of the living space being on the second floor, which has that amazing uh, ability and uh, what I guess result, I should say, of being at the tree, tree line. The tree line, you know, living amongst the trees and also seeing more sky. There's something super. Uh, revolutionary about that single move, that single move of flipping the script and putting the living spaces upstairs. Um, you can see the little details and everything still impresses me. You can see at the beginning from the hallway to the kitchen, the flooring changes. It helps demark the form, it helps demark the space. The kitchen has been totally um, reduced down to its basic necessity. No upper cabinets, no clutter cabinets. I mean, before this, we're, this is 1928, 29. This was, you know, kitchens before this were wood cabinets, tiled walls, 
this is all about a machine. It's about washing, cleaning, eating like a machine. So everything is sleek, stainless steel. It's minimal as possible, all while viewing nature and understanding and seeing the world beyond. This, uh, this villa, I can't t tell you how much changed my life. I actually didn't realize it at the time, but it really did. And I think at this moment, I was struck with what the power of interiors could do. So much struck when I was there. I had a complete stranger take a picture of me in his chair and, and to capture that moment. Because I remember having this moment of walking through here and being awestruck. And I think that was a very informative element of my life to where I am today. Not only did this happen, but on that backpack trip, I found myself a week later in Barcelona, Spain. And I went to the Barcelona Pavilion. So I think not only one moment, but the second moment of then viewing this by Mies van der Rohe and Lily Reach was set. I was, could not believe the power of how they did their interior spaces. And by interiors, it really pushed the envelope of what is the interior and what is the exterior. There was no border. There was no border. Interiors, it, oops, interiors is not just applying something to four walls. It's working alongside of an architect or with the architect or as the architect to really define color palette and finishes. Whereas Mies, or as, whereas Le Corbusier was about functionalism and practicality, Mies van der Rohe was more about opulence and extravagance, I would even say. I mean, look at this space and look at his use of marbles. He, the onyx marble uh, coming up uh, in this slide. This, that's pretty luxe and it's very, but yet super minimal. The use of this onyx, this red onyx, and then the travertine, and then the use of green marble throughout the space, but done in the most minimalist way and then how all the interior spaces bleed into the exterior and even to the garden. And where does a garden start and where does interior start? These were profound visits that really affected how I saw architecture. And I hope by you visiting with me this little, tour, um, this little visit to my past, you can see how um, it too can help you see architecture different as well. But this is not limited to Mies van der Rohe or Le Corbusier. I mean, there's some other great references and great designers that you know you can't get to it all in school. But you can also you continue to learn. You continue to discover new people. Lino Bombardi, an incredible Italian female architect that moved to Brazil and became, according to Wikipedia one of the most influential Brazilian architects of her time. But that's where I disagree with Wikipedia. She was more than an architect. She did a lot more than architecture. She designed, she designed not only architecture, but she designed interiors. She designed furniture. She did interior decoration, whatever you want to call it. But she did it all. These, these are all some of her furniture that she designed. She was a revolutionary force and someone that you should know. Um, also, you should learn about Charlotte Perrion. She also was an incredible, incredible architect. Even on Wikipedia, it still says she's an architect, but she's more. She not only did the ski, lo ski lodge in the French, French Alps, but she was a revolutionary interior designer. Her use of wood and stone, she had an incredible eye for color and textiles. She was always using textiles. She, she moved to Japan for a few years where she gathered all that information and absorbed all that culture. You can kind of see it here with some of the textiles on that chair and that mix. You can obviously see her infamous dining chairs, the thrash seat, the wood back. Um, 
but she also did this amazing collection of bookcases, which are world-renowned and, and very incredible. But one thing I do want to talk about with these designers is, you know, they not only are architects, they're not only interior designers, they're not only furniture designers, but they are collabor collaborators. Um, all of them were amazing collaborators. I think that is incredibly important to today to take away. Um, Charlotte collaborated with um, uh, all other designers to really create amazing things. And as designers today, as an interior designer, as an architect, you have a team that you need to work with, whether it's your own internal team or you're working with an interior designer if you're an architect or if you're an interior designer and you're working with an architect. That collaboration is so critical and so important. Yes, these uh, incredible designers that I went through did it all, but that doesn't mean they did every single thing on their project. They collaborated together, and that's super important to realize in how a great project happens. A great project does not happen by one person. A great project happens by a team, and a team is usually a village. Think about it. Think about one office handling a project, but then you're working with a collaboration of a landscape designer, an architect, uh, a graphic designer, a structural designer, a landscape architect. There's so many people involved on the design. And then you integrate during fabrication the contractor, all their subs, the upholsterer, the painter, the mill worker. It's a village. And to make a house or make any built product happen, it takes a team. And to make a team run well, you have to collaborate well. So I, today I want to also really reiterate, that's why you were you in teams and really something is not singular, ever. Never is it singular. And in real life, that collaboration and that communication is really, really important. So some takeaways here um, about interiors. Um, I want to stress how I want to, we can all really think about interiors and furniture should not be pushed as secondary. It's not something that is thought as thought of second. I, I actually still get this question a lot. Neil, we're looking to hire a designer. When should we bring an interior designer on board? Right away, before you bring, the same time you bring an architect on board. It should happen seamlessly. A great project results with great collaboration from the beginning. Um, we live, work, and eat so much more inside. Make it a priority. It's a, it's, it should be a priority of interiors. A great building is great by how it functions and not just an impressive exterior mass. I, I think overall, we still have such a traditional bias that architecture is supreme and interiors is secondary. I'm not sure, I think it's just the nature of this idea of a building on a pedestal and everyone loves looking at it. Um, but interiors are just as important. We live and breathe them. We, we are in one today. So I think that is something I like to shift and that we all should be thinking about. Um, of course, you know, we talked about this, but uh, the architecture schooling and form and structure and site planning and so much is taught in those short few years. And so much more has to be learned when you leave. And so much is learned after you leave because you can't get to it all. You, you are realize how much communication and collaboration and running a business, all those things are barely touched upon in school. But one of the biggest things is collaboration and doing that with your team, with your client, because there's no client that just gives you free reign. There's always a client. There's always some element of collaboration with a client. So really having that um, understanding and mindset when you go into the world is super important. Secondly, um, is, I guess, collaboration, which I've been talking about. It's really, it's critical, and I can't keep reiterating how 
critical that is to do this and to really great, to make great architecture creates uh, great interiors. Um, so when you work on our project, remember to think more about the ex exterior and include the interior space. And here's some of our work and how we do that. Not only did we work on the exterior and the massing, but we think about how that relates to the interior. It's how do you bring the same finishes in? How the black ebonized uh, cedar becomes the same finish on the inside. You start blurring those boundaries. Uh, obviously here was also how do we position the house to have every view uh, of the water accessible. And it's a very narrow uh, property, so really orienting the house along parallel with that water view. Even the furniture layout is, I think, not th I think, but it's critical. I have seen so many rooms that are really killed by the layout of the furniture, uh, where it's taking too much mass. Here you can see the furniture, it's actually a huge sofa. It's like 13 feet long, plus with the sheds, but yet it's not overwhelmed the space. It's pushed up against the wall. There's actually a TV to the, to the left, but also you can still see the view. So it's functioning as their TV room, but still with a view. Um, and considering kitchens, kitchens and baths should not be regulated to an afterthought. They should not be just, that's something that someone else can do or we won't worry about. I see a lot where, that, where architects don't really even approach it. And I think that's really a, a missed opportunity where you can design a bathroom or in this case, a pool bath right off the pool with a shared sink communal space and a private shower and a private toilet room to really echo the whole effect of the house. Even uh, the choice of furniture. So, you know, furniture, obviously there's an art to that as well. And when you think about interiors, there's interior architecture, there's interior decoration, there's an, many different names. I, I don't really prescribe to one name. I think everyone has their own unique set of talents and abilities. Uh, but having the right selection of furniture in the right space and the scale is critical. When a chair is too big, chair is too small, it overwhelms the space. So that proportion and sense of scale that applies to an overall home, obviously applies to every detail, even to the thickness of a cushion. This, this is a little breakfast nook. Um, the, and it was tight on space. So pushing the banquette against the wall, letting that wood pop just a little to relate to the dining table and the other chairs. Obviously uh, having them all wood so they all were cohesive but yes, they did still say something without saying something too loud was um, the overall strategy. A next um, example is this house we worked on. Not only was the exterior, but how that relates to the interior. And I see so many modern houses where it, like the work just stops as soon as the shell is done. But that's where the work just begun, begins. And really using a modern house and showing how a modern house can still be comfortable, a modern house can still have color, a modern house can still be playful. This house, for instance, you can see this is the great living room, floor to ceiling, window, glass, which is a huge design problem. I mean, how do you furnish that? You have to be really delicate with your furniture so you're not walking into the back of a high sofa. The sofa backs have to be low, yet still comfortable. You have to have chairs that really work with that condition. These two chairs are famous chairs by Pierre Paulin, uh, a famous French designer from the mid-century. They swivel. Not only are they fun to look at, they're super comfortable, they're iconic, and they actually function, and they swivel to the two different uh, conversation areas. Another also important element is just the layout of furniture itself. You can see here the great room is huge. Uh, it's like 35 feet by 45 feet. 
So how do you do that? You can't just rely on one sofa and two chairs facing it. You have to really have a really thoughtful furniture layout that really extends to a room full of 50 if you could if you have people over for an event or a conversation of two. And furniture layout is an art in itself to really have that uh, flexibility and that scale down. Here you can see also in this view how we carried the finishes in from the outside um, to the inside to really make this glass box really feel open to the exterior. Um, this uh, ceramic sculpture is, uh, it was by the, actually the clients, is one of the first things or the only things they came to the table with and obviously um, we put in the living room the client jokes that they built this house around the sculpture because they had this sculpture, but it really set the stage for the whole design of this house. The color palette, the French mid-century aspect of it, it really set the vibe of, and it was a critical um, design element for me to bounce off. Uh, you can see the colors are picked up throughout the rest of the house. To the right is a floor to ceiling painted door, a French blue. Uh, the doors are all throughout the whole house painted blue to give, um, to give it a signifier. Um, you can see here back to the original slide just how that furniture layout does work with uh, a seating area in front of the fireplace and a seating area against the wall. Going into the kitchen, how we marry interiors with exterior. Um, this is a good example of that and really working how the kitchen can really be pushed up against the wall. Uh, and eliminating uppers, um, and also still not being so serious. We added this pop of color, the same blue throughout the rest of the house to create some levity. It's actually this client's second home. It's their summer house in the Hamptons. And also using decoration and not being afraid to do that, and, or even saying that, uh, that word, uh, with the plates on the soffit. Um, it was a soffit that it wasn't, it's not really a soffit, it's more of a header for the windows, unfortunately, because we had this awning that created that uh, architectural leftover space and we didn't want to drop the height of the kitchen. So we had this awkward space between the height of the window and the ceiling that looked a little accidental, but once we put plates on there and it became a play of an old fashioned kitchen in the modern space. So really using art placement, decoration elements to really make a space fun, livable, and also just um, really playful. Another view, this is a view from their, you can see their dining table on the left, a little peak of the dining chair. But this, I show this because it shows how we were very, um, very, very uh, important to us to bring materials inside the house. Uh, we worked closely to wherever possible to carry that finish throughout. Not only the finish, but also here it's uh, cedar shake and we stained it gray as we did on the outside uh, to really blur the difference between interior and exterior. And you can still do that and still be very architectural about it and still have fun by adding antiques. You, uh, we found this an antique chair. This is an African chair. has a great um, pop of color and pattern. And you can do that also in other rooms. Here we thought creative, creatively and innovatively to really um, create a different dynamic of seating. This is our sunken living room. Um, which obviously has precedent in uh, other mid-century homes. But really taking that and obviously expanding it to a super size, to a much more um, grand scale for them and their kids. And it's their hangout room. I think they live most of their life in this room. And it's an incredible opportunity to really, an interaction to be honest, with the the grass and the, the property beyond. Um, it's a great relationship to the nature. And you can see in the background, that's their guest house, um, which we also worked on. 
So I guess in conclusion, um, I want to reiterate that we all live, eat, and sleep inside daily. So let's elevate the importance of interior spaces with more integration in our schools, practices, and our daily conversations. Thank you for your time today, and I'm so honored for the invitation to be here. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. This project, uh, I reference it to our East Hampton project. Um, it's a home in East Hampton in New York. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, I, you know, I consider myself a modernist. I consider myself, um, you know, I, I, but I also love many things. But I am a vehicle to my clients. All our clients come to us for different things. I would say every client says I want a modern comfortable home <laughs> but then after we have that initial conversation they all like some other things and so we go through a you know a series of meetings it's more like a warshak test where they're sharing sharing imagery with me um, they're sharing imagery from their pinterest board and i get to know their style um, I, I also get to learn who they are just by seeing them and their style they have with their wardrobe. It says a lot. You, know, I can, you can kind of see that uh, a lot and also their existing home. So when I first meet with a client, their, their first physical appearance, how they put themselves together, their existing home, how they live, I already get a vibe. Then they start showing me what they want to achieve and it's starting to build a vocabulary that I build from and the team builds from. Um, and then that keeps getting layered as we go through the design process because that client may not know they like leather until it's put in front of them. And like, oh, right, I don't like that. <laughs> and so you learn through the process, oh, this client doesn't like antiques. So they, they love French antiques, but they don't like distressed or patina. Or this client loves you know, like high glossy things. So I am not the designer that it's my way, the highway, and this is the pres presentation, and this is what we do, and here's your project. It, it's, it's a listening, and it's that um, working with your client to really create something new. And that's, and I think our work does change a lot because of that, I think, and I pride myself on that to really keep things different because every home is for a per personal client and and your home should be unique and it shouldn't look like your neighbors nor do our clients want it to be that way so i think that's what drives it yes malcolm um sure um it's years in the making um you know as I mentioned my first boss turned to me about the rug. Since that day, I delved into the world of furniture. I, you know, I showed some pieces of furniture from Charlotte Perrion and Lena Bombarda. Uh, there's, the world of furniture is a world upon itself and it fascinates me and it's so much creativity. Uh, you think designing a home or a house or a structure is hard, designing a chair is really hard. I remember being in school and we had to design a chair. It is one of the hardest things to do, to be petite, lightweight, comfortable, mobile. So furniture has always been a fascination of mine. It's uh, something I love to collect, I love to learn about. When I travel, I collect it or see something, I buy it. 
Uh, and as a designer, you do start collecting pieces. You see, oh wow, that chair, I, um, when you're traveling somewhere, you know, it's a good deal, I'll just buy it. And you start, you find yourself, at least for me, find, form a, co a collection of furniture. Um, and I think that's always been my goal, to always have some type of shop to really create a branding element that's not, that's more accessible to not just our high-end cl private clients. Um, it's also a passion of mine, and it's another passion of mine. I think I'm a big believer that you should really love what you do. If you don't, you should try to find what you, that, and that should be your profession. Uh, so collecting is a big passion for me, and this is an, another way to really use that passion. Uh, I'm opening it with my husband, who's here. He and I are opening a shop uh, in the next few months. Uh, it will have antiques and vintage finds, but we're also using that opportunity to showcase um, my first furniture collection. Um, all projects we do, we do custom furniture, like always. I would say it's at least 70% custom. Can we find vintage chairs, vintage side tables? Yes. Uh, sofas are not comfortable. <laughs> A sofa from 1950, they're petite, they're small, they're shallow. Beds don't hold up well. Upholstery doesn't hold up well overall through the years. Can you reupholster? Yes, but you know we have evolved. People want even more comfortable things. Sofas are super deep, super loungy. Uh, so we find ourselves making that a lot. Um, so over the years, I've always been sketching. I've always been thinking and creating and evolving certain designs for clients. So I'm pulling out kind of the greatest hits, and we're showcasing in our showroom. Yes. Um, what challenges have you run into transitioning into interiors in the field um, that architecture students can kind of mitigate in the school? Um, I don't know if it's a challenge, but I would just um, start thinking about materiality. Like, um, obviously, there's so much to learn in school, so much, and you can't cover it all. Uh, I think you never cover it all, but I think just opening your mind to that and thinking about uh, who are, you know, start Googling and go to websites and start putting in furniture, get, you know, read, up, read about books on furniture, antique furniture, who were the revolutionary furniture designers over the last 100 years, 200 years, the history of furniture. Like, it's been fascinating. I always love reading about furniture from you know Louis the 14th or Edwardian furniture it's fascinating it's so much craft that has been done many centuries ago that we've lost and that still remains through furniture and some very few select buildings but furniture is something that you can have tangibly in your office or your home and your office but it's something that's something that's very accessible and it's a great way to learn and it's also super inspiring. So I would definitely research furniture and talk and look at that. I also look at fabrics, um, rug material. Like fabrics are super important. Um, if you're in New York City or Chicago, go to the design building, walk around. Uh, that's how I learned. There's a there's a building in New York City called the D and D. It's called the Design and Decoration Building. It's where all designers go to buy fabric. And there's other shops there too, but to find the world of what fabric to use and all the different options out there, I mean, there's a lot of options. So just, it's eye-opening. So I would urge you to go to a field trip, go to Chicago, go to the design center there. It will just open your eyes to all the possibilities. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Sure. Maybe in relation mm. to color theory, but yeah. maybe just if you have a sort of an approach. Um, well, when I first started, I was against color, <laughs> like a lot of architects. That extra, and uh, John Key, not so much. But my second boss was anti-color, so we were not used. To, we were not trained to use color at all. 
um, it was beige, beige, beige. This was, you know, late, I guess, I guess this was 2000, mid 2000s. It was John Pawson and minimalism and white and beige. Uh, and their color wasn't being used much, to be honest. Um, and where I worked didn't use it. So I didn't have any knowledge of it, except at that time when I was working in Russell Grove's office, I did a lot of high-end um, retail shops. I worked for Tiffany and, and Coach. And through those projects, I mean, I saw how their brands, I was in charge of getting their brand identity through the shop. And we had to apply the Tiffany blue to the store. But not, in a, but in a chic, interesting way, and not so in your face. So those projects definitely kind of was my first foray into color. Uh, when I first went off my own, I definitely experimented with a lot of different things. I was kind of, oh wow, this is like it was like my brand new canvas, and some of my projects were super colorful, and I really kind of experimented. But I also experiment most on my own apartments over the years. And I think as architects and designers, you do that. It becomes your own laboratory. It was super critical for me and super helpful for me to kind of, s especially being tra trained as an architect and not really knowing the world of fabrics, I experimented on myself. I tested things out in my living room. I'm like, oh, well, that works. That does not work. This is, it needs to be lighter, brighter. So it was a lot of uh, trial and error. Um, how I approach color with clients is really kind of, you know, just like how much they're game for. Uh, I love color now. I love a lot of color. Uh, our projects vary in intensity. Um, this project, the client loved color, um, and we really went for it. I mean, uh, I, I think they're, I, I love color, but color done well for me is balanced with wood. And that, what's ground, what that is what grounds it. Color works for me when it's contrasted with a natural object or low sheen or a matte surface. And, or even like in this case, that rug, even though it's color, has a lot of texture. And so it just takes that color down a notch. Um, can it still work in a high gloss room? Yeah, but that's not really, I guess, ideal for me. Other designers, you know, it's much more polished, it's much more shiny. It's, it would be a different vibe. Um, but how I approach color, I'm always looking at color and then offsetting it with a natural object. And also like the outside, like this project I knew, this, uh, there's so many windows, I knew green was gonna be a huge factor. Uh, green was all around it and how I wanted to have that blue throughout the whole house. You can see even the other house in the distance, it has a blue door. The blue was a signifier throughout the whole property for um, different spaces. Yes? Favorite combination? Um, well, I. Overall, I think I'm just analyzing myself. I like blue more than orange. Uh, <laughs> I, I find myself liking warmer colors, um, blues, greens. Um, but I wouldn't say I have my favorites. I always like to kind of push myself. Yes. Um, well, there's, it's always a conversation about, you know, like what they're looking for. Then we get hired and we, we present mood boards and imagery uh, of other spaces or other um, exteriors, other interior spaces to really kind of get their feedback without doing a lot of drawing, without a lot of um, people power without drawing a huge rendering or a huge design and like, oh no, don't like that. You wanna you know, slowly chip off 
a direction so you know it's always going in the right direction instead of putting all your bet into something they haven't seen. You don't do that. As a business, it's going to be a disaster. And you're also, it's not going to go well for the client. And the client's not involved. A, a good client and a happy client is a client that feels like they're always involved. And they, they are involved. And so you keep them involved throughout that process and chip off a little bit at a time. So you do imagery at the beginning. And you talk about it. And you can point. You can say, why do you like this image? And, or, and you can get so much from them. And you, store that in your brain and you start when you start designing you can pull from those likes and dislikes into an actual uh, plan but then you also design in stages you do a floor plan whether it's architectural floor plan or the furniture layout you do that with a series of materials that are not necessarily um, designated to any particular piece or wall or or furniture but you get their take, and they will like, you know, this is what I'm thinking for the living room, this, ski, this color palette, and this color palette. And you'll get a lot of feedback from that. And like, oh, no, I'm actually thinking more browns. And so you're not wasting your time of doing a huge selected scheme. It's not, and it's going out the window. So you really are doing baby steps throughout the whole process and getting them involved. Um, and, you know, I'm a big believer of uh, options and doing uh, you know, doing a design, but it could go all blue, or we could do all, something all neutral, and so it's it's a discussion, and it's not here is your design. Any other questions? Great, thank you all. <laughs>